Thank you. Um, yeah, here I am back again talking about epigenetics and responsibility. Sorry. Um, so this is, uh, but this is not my thesis. This is a work much more people contributed to. It's an edited volume. Uh, and it's edited by me and Anna Smidor and Daniela Kutash, who are uh, professors uh, really closely connected to our project and working in uh, Sweden and Norway. And they've been part of our international team uh, from day one. Um, and this um, volume is really also deliverable from this, this project. Uh, so there's one work package in the neuroepigenetics project that's really a conceptual work package. And uh, this is uh, very much the result of that. Um, so once again, this is also open access. Uh, it will be available uh, early 2024. So you still have to wait for a little bit, um, but then it will also be available online and uh, in hard copy. Um, but the, the overarching idea behind this volume uh, is to start from the, a, a dynamic conception of human nature. Uh, so a conception of human nature as in constant, uh, humans in constant interaction with influencing and influenced by uh, their environment for example, through epigenetic mechanisms. And um, the idea that this dynamic shift has implications for uh, various philosophical issues. So for example, um, there is, has been much talk about implications for personal identity or implications for the nature nurture distinction. Uh, but in this volume, we touch upon a lot of those, but we really delve into the implications specifically for moral responsibility. Um, for thinking about this, for how to distribute it um, in different contexts. So um, we build on the existing debate on epigenetic responsibility, which is really lively and, and yeah, diverse. Uh, and we add some new philosophical approaches to it. And um, yeah, this uh, edited volume only has seven chapters. So that's why uh, I am in the, um, yeah, I do have the opportunity to share with you really quickly what each chapter is about, just to give you an idea. Um, so the first chapter by Christine uh, argues for developmental, so if you have questions about this, you know what to be, uh, for a developmental view of life. Um, it draws on the example of autism research to illustrate how bioethics um, ethicists can work with scientists really to challenge uh, reductionist views of life that consider human beings and their challenges as merely the result of either genetic or only uh, environmental factors. Then uh, I wrote chapter two. It's also part of my PhD thesis. This is really about this uh, approach uh, that focuses on forward looking collective responsibility and a framework built on that as a way of distributing moral labor uh, in the context of epigenetics. Um, then the third chapter is also about collective responsibility, but takes a different approach. Uh, the authors there built on previous work that they did on uh, moral luck and the work that questions the causality condition of uh, responsibility claims for both individuals and collective agents. Um, so what they do is they draw on the notion of what they call aritaic blame and they propose a model for collective commitments uh, for the protection of our epigenomes that is based on the evaluation of the words of certain collective agents, such as uh, public health agencies and NGOs. So they try to salvage some kind of collective responsibility in the context of a lot of uncertainty with regards to epigenetic mechanisms. Um, then the fourth chapter uh, is really on uh, reproductive ethics. Uh, it talks about um, concepts such as non-identity and harm. And uh, it explores um, the question of whether epigenetic alterations uh, to sperm, eggs, or embryos uh, may or may not be viewed as uh, harmful to resulting offspring. And that's really a, a great uh, exploratory uh, chapter. Um, then chapter five is about uh, parental responsibility and responsibility for children. Um, and the author argues that by blurring the boundary between the social and the biological uh, contributions to children's lives, epigenetics extends the reach of responsibility for children and thereby also calls into question the proportion of responsibility uh, that should fall on the shoulders of biological parents. And I think this is also very uh, much in line um, with uh, a contribution or with some ideas from the contribution by uh, Joke. We will also hear tomorrow in the non-Western session. Um, then chapter six elucidates some of the complexities um, uh, in the responsibility equation that arise when AI technology in general, or also what she does talk about uh, machine learning in particular, are employed to um, 
analyze epigenetic data. So it's really this specific topic of AI. And then the final chapter uh, goes uh, is, is not really on epigenetics, but instead on the mi microbiome. And the authors, um, Christine and Eman, argue um, that even more than in epigenetics, they say the recent findings regarding to the microbiome could brain access really challenge these atomistic and static conceptions of organisms. Uh, so they discuss what this then might mean for responsibility as well. So, uh, yeah, we really hope that this volume, although it's uh, yeah, ethical perspectives and there's a lot of philosophical uh, content there, it's really, we hope it's interesting not only for philosophers, but for a much broader audience of, of scholars and students working with these concepts and issues uh, we discuss here. Um, so, yeah, we um, admit that, uh, that the applied normative debates are really fast paced. Um, but we also think that we shouldn't be afraid to be yeah, radically crit critical and to take time for reflection as well, which is what we try to do in this forum. Okay, then I'm up, I guess. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Dan. I um, wrote a book that is uh, coming out in 2024 and in Dutch it's called For We Precies and Onderzoek naar de Patient in Precisie I will now offer a clumsy translation in English which would sound something like, uh, for whom precisely uh, an inquiry into the patient in precision medicine. Um, and it's the first book in the Health Humanities series by the uh, Center of uh, Expertise, Metrodora, which is a health humanities center, which was uh, started by uh, Leni, Christine and uh, Katrien Schouwbroek, and in which several other members of our team are involved. And it's, uh, I hope it gets published in 2024 uh, via Letterwerk. And so the idea is uh, that I, wrote a book for a bit of a broader audience, uh, but I'll throw some state of the arts terms in this because of course you're, you're experts on this, right? Um, so the book's about precision medicine, which is this novel approach of doing uh, medical research and care, in which we combine insights from molecular biology uh, and data science to gather a lot of information about patients, uh, ranging from uh, the genome to proteomics, but also epigenomic uh, data. But in addition to this, uh, we intend to also gather a lot of other data uh, not traditionally considered to be uh, of medical value, such as uh, online behavior, but also stuff from wearables. And through combining this very heterogeneous data set, uh, they aim to really characterize the individual patient uh, on a molecular level, but also to personalize care and empower uh, patients. And if you look at the uh, literature on the ethics of uh, precision medicine, we see a lot of debates about the privacy issues that brings up uh, about bias, about returning these results to, uh, to individuals. But in this book, I take serious the epistemic shift. So what happens in precision medicine is a shift in what medical knowledge can be. It's vastly oops, expanded to include a lot of uh, different data. And I look at this claim uh, of precision medicine presenting medicine as a harder science. Um, and what I do in this book is I, uh, I look at the impact of this extension of medical knowledge uh, on care. So more downstream, how does this affect the patient? And I tackle that question to a, a range of chapters uh, in which I tackle uh, these questions. So uh, in one chapter, I ask, uh, do data always know best? Or I question the implications of uh, precision medicine and epistemic authority, do patients still know uh, about their health? Is their testimony something that is still valuable or really characterizing them on the individual level? In another chapter, I ask, should we always want to know, where I look at um, the introduction of risk as a central concept within medicine and the uncertainty that brings. So also the category of medical uncertainty gets vastly expanded uh, for individual patients. Mm -hmm. And in the third chapter, I uh, ask, is disease just a label? So one of the ideas behind precision medicine is that we should get rid of all these coarse grained categories. So characterizing a patient as having diabetes doesn't really make sense. We should look at the individual level, at the molecular level. Um, so basically they propose a new taxonomy where uh, a category like diabetes uh, doesn't make sense anymore. So there I'm looking at what disease labels actually do and how they uh, can help in self-understanding but also in the form, forming of community. And in this book, I take up the lens of feminist philosophy of science, where I argue that the uh, 
view on medicine proposed by precision medicine is uh, relatively partial. It takes health and disease to be characterized uh, to a large extent as something that's quantifiable, but also uh, expressible in uh, molecular parameters. And so based on feminist philosophy of science, I argue that th this is just one view on health that we can, um, we can provide. And uh, taking the idea of Sandra Harding uh, seriously, that we should start research from the margins. I look at what patients as marginalized knowers uh, might contribute to precision medicine. So basically, I suggest that the uh, phenomenological knowledge they have on illness experience, including a range of uh, societal and social aspects, can helpfully supplement uh, what is currently being envisioned as central to medicine uh, within precision medicine. And since that does not really fit into the precision medicine framework, I argue that through epistemic injustice, uh, precision medicine might not live up to this empowerment of patients and the actual personalization of care, um, since the patient testimony increasingly seems to be uh, irrelevant uh, within that particular framework. Okay. Ah, and I also wanted to say, so in the initial idea, we were supposed to uh, use drawings, which I have shown here and here. Uh, they unfortunately didn't make the cut, uh, but they were made by Fien van der Beke, and she really likes working with academics, so uh, reach out if, uh, mm -hmm. if you need drawings for, uh, for your work. So now we have some time for questions. Um, I'll maybe first just ask the audience if there are already some uh, questions there. Uh, you can raise your hand if you have a question. I'll bring over the mic. Uh, If not, I will start with the first question and then we'll come back to you. Um, so a first question to all of you. Um, you've already had, there's already been some time uh, since you had finished your work. Maybe you already had some reactions to it that uh, gave you further insights or maybe um, changed your mind on a few topics you were talking about. Um, so if you would want to elaborate on that, that would be nice. Maybe I'll just give the floor to Emma first, and then we can uh, mm -hmm. go further down. Um, yeah, thank you. So I will be, will be uh, thinking out loud, I think. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, reactions. I, I think most of what I uh, wrote in my thesis is still, I mean, it's not that long ago, so it's quite up to date still, and uh, I still stand by it. Um, but of course, there's things I want to develop more and am more interested in than others. Uh, I think in particular, this concept of collective responsibility is still something I want to use, uh, but also in, in conversation with the authors of the other chapter. So, for example, with uh, Luca Ciaparino, um, I do sometimes wonder whether I want to use the concept uh, that much. So, because it's also it also has some problems. So. With responsibility, the question is always on which basis can you ascribe it to, to agents? Is this based on their um, uh, their causal relation to a certain harm? They haven't contributed to it. Is it uh, uh, related to them benefiting from it or to, to them having the capacity to solve certain issues? And I mostly focus on that, so more forward looking. Um, but of course, uh, such questions are really hard to answer. So there's no 100% no guaranteed deterministic answers to any of these questions in the context of epigenetics. Um, so that may make it hard to really talk about uh, collective responsibility, as it is also hard to talk about individual responsibility. Um, so I do wonder about that sometimes where I should use the concept that much, but at the same time, I think it's really important to keep using it to give us or kind of yeah to counteract or to kind of balance uh, yeah out the imbalance that really exists towards individual responsibility now and putting too much burden on uh, individual people who might be harmed by certain effects. Um, yeah, if there's more, I'll come back. But that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Yes, uh, also the advanced and experimental philosophy of medicine. Was pub it was published this October, so we didn't have much reviews, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I, can, I can maybe, um, what my 
own feeling with the book is, is that it's, it was first of its kind. There were no uh, books on experimental philosophy of medicine. But of course, since we started an edited volume also takes a long time. Since then, there have been other initiatives, for example, experimental bioethics is now also a thing. And there will be an advance in experimental bioethics, which the authors told us was inspired by our experimental philosophy of medicine book. So that's nice. But um, I think that there should be an advances to the advances in experimental philosoph philosophy of medicine, because as we, as we explained in the introduction, I think, and as I also said before, I think one of the main um, interesting things in experimental philosophy is what it's called, what's called the negative problem. A program in experimental philosophy. It's like questioning commonly held assumptions by your typical philosopher. I'm not going to use an epitaph here, but everyone has in their minds what a typical philosopher looks like, I guess. But um, yeah, in the book, most of the contributors are typical philosophers. And I think more uh, experimental work should be done cross-culturally in different people with different cultural backgrounds because that's very important when you think about disease and we cannot assume that if we if we do a prolific query with all mother tongue English speakers like we've been doing that this is somehow bringing us closer to the truth so that's one thing also it would be would have been very good or we should in the in the future engage more with also philosophers scholars uh, from uh, non-Western uh, countries to actually do these kind of stu comparative studies. But um, Edouard Machery, who, who contributed to the volume, uh, is actually doing that right now. In his contribution, he was supposed to do something cross-culturally, but he wasn't able to finish it in time. But these works are coming out now. So he's doing a lot of cross-cultural work in disease now. So uh, yeah, I think. Uh, we made our point and I think it was good to make this volume to sort of uh, point out what can be done uh, in regard to experimental philosophy of medicine, but I think we should go beyond that now. Uh, also think about different methods such as corpus methods. There's one corpus methods in, method in there, I think, uh, but also think more about how experimental philosophy of medicine relates to qualitative research, to other types of gaining knowledge. Um, it would be nice to be able to sort of on a meta level think about how all these methodologies sort of work together to bring us closer to a kind of fair and um, good way of thinking about issues in medicine. And just to quickly add on to that, I think for my own XFI as well, um, that's while I like doing that study, I think one of my conclusions was of this quantitative study, I did online surveys. Um, <laughs> That, that more qualitative research indeed is needed because we were able to measure the strength of people's judgments uh, about cases related to the non-identity problem. So cases about uh, a woman who is pregnant or not yet pregnant and needs to take a certain decision and um, to find out their moral judgments. So we found out the strength, but not the reasons behind it. And uh, I, think, I think it's really important to look into this uh, because the way people reason about these issues seems to be really dependent on some contextual factors that these thought experiments are not sufficiently able to capture in this in this quantitative setting. Um, so indeed, uh, mm -hmm. qualitative research would be great if that's also uh, much more a part of uh, X5. Yeah. yeah, my book is not out yet, so I haven't gotten <laughs> any responses, but it's also the topic of my PhD, so I've been uh, thinking about it a bit more and something I'll present in, in the next session as well. Uh, here I really took a top down view. I looked at the sort of logic behind precision medicine uh, and in my work now I'm engaging more with the actual practice of how uh, these technologies such as those in proteomics and mass spectrometry work in the lab um, and that reveals that it might be more complex than, than that I presented here. Um, on the other hand, what has been uh, very helpful for me in sort of reworking this for a broader audience is uh, finding that language to, to reach uh, a broader audience. Um, so that's something that I uh, really appreciated on trying to translate this to different contexts. Uh, 
I'll look at you again. Do you, is there anyone who has a question? Yes. Yes, so I was wondering whether there are any ideas on, on ethics of preventive, uh, like the ethics of epi using epigenetics in preventive medicine. So for example, if yeah, there's, for example, epigenetic signatures of Alzheimer's disease and epigenetics is like cumulative thing during life. Mm -hmm. um, so imagine that someone can measure like a signature of Alzheimer in a very early stage. So how this will impact like decisions uh, yeah, on future life quality or on future life decisions. Um, yeah, so or it could also be something else. So um, I was imagining also like BRCA1 mutation. Sometimes if you have a BRCA1 genetic mutation, then people are doing some breast surgery to prevent that they develop breast cancer. But if you would have BRCA methylation changes, like epigenetic uh, changes, which also would increase the risk of breast cancer, would this also become like a strategy to design, okay, we have to decide now to prevent. It's more a probability. It's not always a binary prediction, yes or no. So where do we have to have like a cutoff or a threshold or how this will impact future decisions in health or life quality for aging diseases? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. And I think, um, I think I, I, I'm, I'm not going to answer this with yes or no, this is ethical or this is not ethical. That's really not the my style, I guess. But I think um, what we need to do when we talk about epigenetics is maybe also look at the ethics itself, the ethics of how do we think about these things? Because you give the example of BRCA and of course, I think libraries are written about is it ethical that well that we uh, detect this and that we or, or that we detect this, for example, in, in 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 children and that we then proactively do all these kinds of things? There's a lot of things to do, um, and uh, of course the jury is still out. Some people argue yes, some people argue no, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I'm go not going to go into details with that, but with the epigenetics, I think it it sort of forces us to think otherwise eh? because. What do we know about epigenetics? You a uh, million times more than me, but uh, <laughs> but for example, it's 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 more like the, it's dynamic. Eh? Can we really uh, look at it the same way as we look at genes and say like, okay, this is now what the epigenetics of this person is. So we we'll have to either do this or do that in order to prevent something. Eh? I don't know if that's feasible. I, I think we we may have to look at it more in dynamics ways and not in deterministic ways and also our ethics should not just assume that it's it's the same as we we have always been doing for genes eh? um, and oh, it, it becomes complicated because we have this move towards pre preventive medicine and in this move to our preventive medicine especially when it comes to epigenetics and especially when it comes to food etc etc there's a lot of work being done to 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 buy by changing lifestyle, etc., to, to make sure that your epigenetics is better or whatever that means. Um, but on the other hand, there is always this, this level of unpredictability. And I'm, I don't want at this point to say anything about we should do this, we should do that, because I'm very wary of these kind of deterministic approaches to epigenetics that sort of, they end up in in, in having a very individualized approach to health. Like, okay, you're now pregnant, you shouldn't eat, uh, you should eat bacon, then your child will become uh, smarter. That's something that was in the news a couple of times ago. I think we were doing something even worse than we did with, with looking at genes deterministically, if you look at epigenetics in this way. Um, so 
like the work that Emma has been doing about collective responsibility. Uh, also, we are now starting a project uh, proposal on microbiomics and on, um, on health, on microbiomic health. And we risk there also indeed to, to look at it as very, okay, we know this kind of microbiome is of a healthy person, whatever that means. Philosophers are not yet sure what that actually means, but anyway. So we have to make sure that people do this in order to, to attain that. Uh, that's, that's, that's really a very standard approach of, of looking at things. But I think especially epigenetics will, shows us that, that there is a lot more to responsibility than pointing the blame to. to and, and that's not a question, an answer to your question, but it just shows us how difficult it is and how maybe we shouldn't be too fast to giving answers to should we now prevent pregnant women to eat whatever so that their child becomes whatever. I don't know. Can you comment on it? <laughs> so I also believe that we should think less deterministic about epigenetics. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of redundancy in epigenetics that we do not understand. Um, so like if you do, just take a cross-sectional study on epigenetic signatures, mm -hmm. so you will find maybe some very bad signatures, but people look perfectly healthy mm -hmm. because depending on other life conditions or the, the, the nutrition style can have a big like context mm -hmm. dependent impact on the outcome of, of the bad signature. Mm -hmm. And this makes it very complicated to really have really uh, accurate predictions on what, how the things will, uh, evolve and we also see that nature has like found different solutions for a problem yeah. uh, and it's not that we always use the same if the same genes to solve a problem if you just take a cross-sectional uh, cohort you will find that in 100 people everyone solves it in a unique way and we cannot extract which is the perfect way or the healthy way because maybe 30 people find another solution and they all look perfectly healthy yeah. and they all have some hidden bad signatures in the backpack but for a while they can manage mm -hmm. so yeah, there's quite buffer capacity what i also learned from you from you is that epigenetic signatures some are very sticky and some are very dynamic mm -hmm. and we don't know which ones are sticky and which are yeah. dynamic so to say and which yeah. yeah thank you that's that's very very mm -hmm. relevant and also well, we have, as philosophers, we have this idea of oh, epigenetics is, is like the, the, how do you say it, the shackle, uh, the chain between uh, genes and environment. But then, then you ask, and then people say, oh, we, we should study more environment, but we're now engaged also in a cost action that wants to study environment. But then if you ask, what do you mean by environment? <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> So even there, there is a lot of work still to be done on a conceptual level. What do we mean? Genes and environment are not on the same level. Okay. You have the genes and then you have lots of stuff which we now all put under environment. And that's also, I'm mm. sorry, mm. Yeah, Emma, you go. No, I just I wanted to add shortly, it's totally in line with this, um, mm -hmm. that there's, I think there's also the risk um, of, of, of social stigma. And I think that, that the the, the popular discourse, um, even if we don't want to talk about uh, and don't think about epigenetics in, in, in deterministic ways, there's really a risk of it being taken up uh, mm -hmm. as such. And then indeed there may be these bad markers um, uh, that don't really have these, these, these implications, but uh, people may still be stigmatized for this. And also not just for, for having those, but also if it's possible to test for this uh, and to do more of this preventive medicine, to whom will it be accessible? Mm -hmm. um, will this be fair enough? And also, will there be uh, is there risk of stigmatization of people who mm -hmm. um, don't choose to access this for whatever reason or don't have access to this? So I'm thinking here a bit in line with, for example, prenatal tests and um, yeah, the I mean the responsibility that falls on future parents to decide whether they actually want to do those uh, those or not, um, and the social con stigma that can come with that. Uh, and then, of course, but that's the, the typical bioethical uh, concern. There's also the, the, yeah, the fact that there really needs to be a good legal framework, um, as you know very well, um, to make sure that if these data are there, they don't get into the wrong hands and that there are a lot of questions to be asked also about, for example, uh, insurance companies and companies like these, whether they, they, they should have access to such data. So that's just an addition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, I think it's perfect time to switch to the next part. So I'll ask the authors of the second session uh, to come to the front. So this uh, second session, uh, we'll be talking mostly about neurodiversity and new approaches to bioethics. Uh, again, I'll let the, the authors speak for themselves. I think they know best what they wrote about. Uh, so we're first starting again with Christine. Uh, we'll be talking about her book on chance encounters. OK. <laughs> you say that the authors know best what the book is about, but I consider writing as a kind of lobotomy so <laughs> or to order my things in my head and then lobotomize them and put them in a book and then yeah then they're also gone from my head i am afraid but anyway i'll try to talk about what chance encounters is about and why i wrote it maybe uh it gives some background to what's in there because i i try to connect many things in the book uh maybe too many things but Anyway, it was necessary for me at that point to write a book, uh, to think about what it means to be a bioethicist, what, what it means to think in a certain way about life, about, uh, about stories, about also about state of our planet. So these are all themes that are in the book. Um, so it's, it's really also about the trajectory I made uh, as a bioethicist from writing a very traditional bioethics PhD on the use of stored tissue samples, genetic information from children in biobanks for research. Uh, so I started there, but it was about return of results, uh, informed consents, all these kind of things that um, people think about when they, all these kind of things that people associate with bioethics and, and genes. And then also how starting to think about autism genetics and what we mean with genes, et cetera, and also getting to know about epigenetic information sort of um, challenged, not, not just uh, ethical questions or conceptual questions, but also challenged me uh, what it means to be a bioethicist and what it should mean to bioethicist to uh, the extent that at a certain point I was like, oh no, I maybe I should give up on being a bioethicist and being a real philosopher instead, or an anthropologist, or whatever, uh, or even a biologist if I could do my life over again. But then the ERC came, and all these wonderful people came, and um, the book is sort of um, the result of many discussions, but also of me wanting to really reclaim bioethics as something that can be valuable and that's. That is a very hard thing to do, but also very, um, um, I'll just say it's a rewarding thing to do. Um, and I started to read uh, the work again of the original person who was one, not the first, but one of the first to frame the word bioethics, which is uh, Van Rensselaer Potter. He was a chemist and he really described bioethics in the 70s as an ethics of life. Eh? Uh, he was also very inspired by. Um, Conrad Waddington, who is like an epigenetics thinker, which we may meet, meet later again. Um, so it all came together, and that's epigenetics, bioethics, they sort of were joined at the hip from the beginning, although we may not see it in later, uh, in, 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 um, incarnations of, of the field. Um, so this is, the book is about thinking what an ethics of life could be, thinking what the bioethicist could be, um, reclaiming bioethics. Um, bioethics, some of you don't know, but in the grand scheme of philosophy or in the hierarchies of philosophy, so, so, sometimes considered a bit of a not very serious type of philosophy, but I think it can also be kind of nickname or a Hürzenam to say like, okay, I'm a bioethicist. I don't care about all these um, things that a philosopher should do. We can, that's also a very nice situation to be, be in. Eh? The idea that as a bioethicist, and that's what I also try to argue here 
as you have a kind of liminal position in between science, philosophy, sociology, with lots of freedom to do what you think you should be done, and you can infiltrate, you can be the idiot in Isabel Stenger's idea, and I think Dan also will come back to that later, or Dan, sorry, Dan, <laughs> back to that later, um, the idea of being like the jester at the science course, Courts and you know, Jester in um, is the only one who can actually say the truth about about uh, King um, about the King. And I think in science you can sort of, as a bioethicist, because you can infiltrate, you can sort of have this responsibility of telling the truth. So that's first part of it: the reconceptualization of what a bioethicist can do with regards to science, not being purely the handmaiden of science, the sort of uh, person they need uh, to check the tick box on the project proposal and to review the um, um, consent forms, but actually also to infiltrate a bit to ask difficult questions. And um, I also think bioethics, once infiltrated, but what we should also uh, what also Van Rensselaer Potter claimed and what other people have, have claimed, people like Donna Haraway, etc., who also uh, functioned prominently in the book, is that the idea that good science is, should be good in different ways, not only methodology, methodologically, but also what, it's, um, what it claims to, to, to want to achieve. Um, we sh as we have discussed before, we should not take for granted reductionist views on life, and that's where the explanation of the epigenetics and the microbes come in in the book. In the in the book, and also I believe what I argue also is that it's not blasphemous to ask scientists to respond to the question of cui bono, why are you doing this, what does it mean for for you to contribute to um, a world that's there to come. And third, and then related to the, the above, I sort of hope to write this book and then retire, but unfortunately, <laughs> uh, once it was finished, of course, a lot of other things came up and oh, shit, I, I, I missed this and I missed that. And so I consider the book not as an endpoint, but as a kind of checkpoint. Uh, I added some quotes of the brilliant Native American philosopher Viola Cordova, um, but that's as far as it goes for non-Western approaches in the book. And it was then, therefore, writing the book also a wake-up call for me to explore this further, because I think there's a lot of opportunity also for bioethics to learn about um, different views of on life from the different cultures. And that's what Fran Lu and Vasha uh, in the team are also exploring. Um, and furthermore, I was very lucky to have uh, Bart and Christina to comment on the book with their art. And the idea of art, just as the idea to include Cordova's ideas, they came relatively late in the book, as it was already written at that point. But for me, uh, they point to the next part I think we should take. Yeah? I think the nexus should not be bioethics science, but bioethics art science. And that's also something we have explored yesterday, but we'll explore later in the conference as well. And we all have our roles as scientists, as philosophers, as artists, but in sweet entanglements. And I think we will explore that further in this conference. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm landscape here. And I want to end with a quote from Viola Cordova because I really love her and I really love this quote because it contains a lot of uh, cats. The earth produces as many things as she's capable of producing. There is not such a thing as men, but there are men. No human, but humans. There is no such thing as cats. As a cat, there are instead jaguars, lions, ocelots, tigers, leopards, and so on. The world is a fulsome place. So I really like this kind of process idea, this idea of there is abundance in the world. And, and yeah, that's uh, what we should try to cherish. But that's uh, for further research. Thank you. Hi. Um, I will present the book Ongehoord, eh, over kleine interacties wanneer woorden niet vanzelfsprekend zijn, translated as unheard, about small interactions when words are not self-evident. It's difficult to translate it because unheard in Dutch means not heard, but also not supposed to. You are not communicate as you are supposed to. Um, it's published in 2021, so it feels already an old book. It's a long time ago. Um, 
it ties in with my focus on the concept of voice and listening to people who are labeled as minimal verbal and nonverbal. So it also targets a broader audience, therefore it's in Dutch as well. Um, it's about the politics and the ethics uh, of voice and listening. And initially it was published in parallel with an exhibition on the same topic in Museum Dr. Ghislain. And every theoretical question there in the, in the uh, exhibition and in the book is always uh, explored in interaction with people for whom communication and the use of language is more difficult. Um, I was interested in the conditions of narrating a story. What is a narrative? Uh, when is someone um, recognized as a narr narrator or not? And why not? And how can we open up the norms of what a narrative is? How can we understand and generate more forms of narrativity and expression? So if someone does not speak, or is labeled as minimal verbal and non-verbal, what does that really mean? Eh? Is, some, is there really no voice? Is there no story? Or are we not capable yet to listen to those people? So together with a lot of other people, uh, I tried to think about these questions and we, 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 uh, it was really based on encounters and on interactions. And in those encounters and interactions, we try to create situations in which voices of people for whom communication is more difficult can emerge and can be heard. And I did this with a lot of artists uh, and people for whom communication is more difficult. Simon Alamers, who is sitting here, uh, wrote a, a story about ghosts and his encounters with someone. Uh, Mariske Broekmeier, who we heard yesterday on voice, um, was exploring the installation of borrowed voices. Uh, she went through all the installations, but one is about borrowed voices and it really ties in with my voice research because we went towards a um, yeah, untangling and de-individualizing of the concept of voice. And therefore it would be nonsense, of course, if I would write this alone because I don't want to have voice um, starting from a single person. Also, people for whom writing is more difficult, and we try to look for ways how we could materialize this in a kind of text, because not everything is text. Um, there is a tension in making a book about uh, going beyond narrative or exploring um, or exploring ways to open up narrative. So therefore, it's printed in blue. We really played with the texture of what a book can be. And there are also drawings in it uh, made by Sonia Yukinini, a Finnish choreographer based in Switzerland, with whom I, um, for two months, was doing a residency in Stuck in Leuven, I think in 2017-18, so a long time ago. Um, and those drawings are really based on the communication and, and interactions with the people who we met there and for whom communication and, and speaking in symbolic with symbolic language is more difficult. Um, beside the introduction, there are four parts. And each part starts with questions um, that direct the reader uh, um, towards kind of topic. And so the first uh, section is on voice, really the concept of voice. Uh, so is this, is this something individual all the time? And could we also borrow someone else's larynx or tongue? Uh, can voice emerge in entanglement of different tongues and gazes? And then the second part is more about encounters. How can we get more attuned to each other? And how can we affect and be affected by one another? Um, so here you see a spreadsheet of questions. Um, and then the third one is about creating, and it ties in with the sessions of yesterday, and the making and doing. How important is making and doing in coming into expression? Is this giving someone sometimes more opportunities to connect with the world and how? And then the last part is about listening. So which voices and story do, stories do we hear and who gets drowned out? And how do voices sometimes also silently invade our bodies? And can we hear too many voices in our head, for instance? 
So also how the book is built up and which author is parallel next to one another uh, is important to me. So we have the voice of a psychiatrist who was really working on psychosis. But at the same time, we have the story of a person who talks about how those voices are present in a body um, with, this, with the question, can we hear too much voices, for instance? Um, That's what I wanted to, to say about it. Okay, so I'm your and I'm the first academic baby of Christine. <laughs> it feels like it's more than a year ago. And it's also more than a year ago. I'm almost able to walk by myself. But luckily, Christine is still close by. So, uh, this is the title of my uh, uh, PhD uh, dissertation, where I have looked at Tourette's, actually Tourette's and autism uh, combined a little bit. Uh, and I think the most important uh, part of uh, uh, the whole book is the letter H, which is also in neuroepigenetics. Uh, I thought this was a very nice thing of Christine to put the age there. So I put it uh, here as well, uh, because on the one hand, uh, being originally an engineer and interested in cognitive science, I'm very much into theory, uh, neurological theory, uh, genetic or epigenetic theory, anything which is theoretical and which has formulas. Uh, sorry, uh, that's the way I am. But I also think that uh, uh, it is impossible to make a good theory if it's not ethical at the same time. Uh, I think this is not the standard thought in public discourse, but I really believe that is uh, the case. So also for this uh, research, uh, I actually started obviously reading literature, uh, but then I kind of uh, blocked on the question epigenetics and what does it mean for moral responsibility uh, in Tourettic people or people with Tourette's. I kind of blocked, so I basically had the pleasure to talk with a lot of people uh, with Tourette's, people that were in academia, but mostly people that uh, were kind of randomly selected. Uh, I told some people that I was doing something on Tourette's and they said, ah, I, my brother-in-law or I have a friend or I met somebody uh, in, uh, yeah, just in a research, in another research community. And so I just talked uh, to them and help, they helped me make sense of uh, the question which resulted in the ideas expressed uh, over here. So I think this idea of looking for theory on the one hand and doing it ethically, which means in this case, I'll be sitting here more today, uh, which means listening to people that are directly affected or is actually uh, unavoidable, is something which is actually needed uh, up to and including quantum physics, which is uh, a little bit my current uh, thing and which is related in my head. But first about the PhD, so the first uh, there's three parts. The first part is mainly on uh, autism and the work that I did on autism. So actually I came into uh, philosophy after an autism uh, diagnosis uh, and uh, luckily there was somebody like Christine which allowed me to take another uh, career, uh, namely this one. So my first work was actually on uh, autism. And on the autism side, uh, I have actually tried to explore uh, the tension between theory and lived experience, between theory and ethics. And I came up with uh, uh, a concept which is uh, neurogradualism, trying to express that actually trying to look for a cutoff. It was mentioned uh, uh, before in conversation, trying to mention for a cutoff or a threshold to neatly separate this type of people from another type of people is uh, stupid, 
to use a direct word. Uh, so that there is always a case of uh, gradualism. Obviously, that opens up the question uh, of uh, is everybody a little autistic and all of that kind of stuff, which is also not the case. So what is there the difference? The difference is the experience. So and you cannot then uh, make sense of something like autism. And I will conclude, I've concluded here, like Tourette's by saying that uh, you can say something about it without lived experience. And hence, you cannot say anything about it uh, purely from a theoretical point of view in formulas, however much I like them. The second part of uh, the thesis uh, was on stigma. Uh, first, I did some experimental philosophy uh, because well, I wanted really to try that. Uh, it didn't go that bad, but then I wrote in the edited volume that Christine uh, prepared. I actually wrote kind of a criticism or experimental philosophy because it was purely quantitative way of looking at things. And I got really, in my own study, I got really messed up uh, with, uh, yeah, what kind of conclusions others took. So basically, I wrote uh, an ethical criticism of doing only experimental philosophy, so that it always had to had to be complemented with, uh, uh, with always had to be complemented with qualitative uh, stuff. The last part, actually, uh, of the the last part exists. Uh, consists of two papers, one letting to Reds be with uh, Diana, who's here, and uh, Hannah de Jager, just an ethical uh, kind of framing of what does it mean if you listen to uh, Tourettic voices, what does it mean of how you see Tourettes, and that basically is summed up in the title letting uh, Tourettes be. Uh, and then the last uh, chapter of the thesis, if this works, actually is on this beautiful drawing, which I will probably not explain. Uh, my daughter made it, uh, and I'm happy the way it turned out. Uh, it's also the cover page of my uh, thesis. Uh, and I don't know whether somebody caught it, uh, but there is uh, a typo. Actually, there are two typos. Uh, so uh, it should read sensory motor. Uh, because that's the technical term, but uh, my daughter forgot the R and the O, so it now reads Sensi Motor. So, and it's actually nice. Uh, I first I got if I would have found out before <laughs> my defense, I would have probably freaked out. But yeah. I found out only afterwards, and apparently either nobody found out. Uh, before, or they all agreed not to tell me, in which case I'm a little bit angry with them, at the same time very happy. Anyway, so basically what it uh, tries to say, and I will not uh, uh, completely explain it, I can always explain it, uh, I have the drawing here, so I can explain it if you want, uh, over coffee, but basically it tries to explain that there is an individual element uh, uh, to Tourette's or autism or other ways of being, a specific way of relating uh, to the world. So A and B are persons, W is the world. There are specific ways of relating uh, to the world. They're not categorical, uh, but there are specific ways. So it doesn't, uh, it's not like everything is the same or everything is uh, social. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are all, also ways of relating to each other. And in that kind of uh, stigma, for instance, can be involved on in the way that people uh, uh, let's say, police norms in uh, society. And there either you can get stuck and people actually get stuck, not because they have Tourette's or autism or whatever. They can get stuck because the other party doesn't dance, basically. And in not dancing, some people get stuck. But if people dance, everybody, everything changes a little bit, including uh, the world, which is uh, a little bit of a quantum physical talk, but at that uh, I will end. So uh, I hope I didn't go too long. I have no idea. Hi, do you hear me well like this? 
Yeah, okay, hi. My name is uh, Gert-Jan, Gert-Jan van Aken. And uh, on the screen, you can see the cover of my PhD dissertation, which I defended in uh, June this year, uh, the same week as uh, Emma defended hers. <laughs> and it's titled as follows, uh, Affirming Neurodiversity, a study on the ethics of early uh, autism detection and intervention. And the main title is, I guess, the direction I moved towards over the years. Uh, and the subtitle, it's more of the, of the starting point. Uh, because about five years ago, there were some universities in Flanders who set up uh, a fairly big uh, research project trying to, uh, uh, to look or to, to detect autism characteristics or its predictors uh, in very young children, trying to predict autism in children under the age of, of two. And the rationale in this study was basically uh, the earlier, the better. But the sooner uh, uh, autism can be can be diagnosed, the sooner specialized care uh, can be offered. And uh, I got involved in examining the ethics of uh, such early autism care. And I guess what we basically try to do is to put a question mark behind this rationale. Is it indeed better? Uh, is sooner indeed always, always better? Uh, and if so, under which circumstances? And when I started my PhD, I uh, was a freshly uh, graduated medical doctor. I was working in uh, child psychiatry. And I was kind of attracted to, uh, to this project because I always had more of an interest in, in public health. And it's more collective and it's preventative uh, aspects as compared to more uh, individualized and curative uh, branches of, of, of uh, medicine. Uh, and so at first, I imagined that I would be looking into these typical questions of public health ethics, such as uh, how can we make these early care practices uh, accessible and affordable? And what about the cost efficacy of these uh, of these uh, uh, practices? But in the end, it turned out uh, to be quite a bit uh, different. And I guess my perspective mainly started to change when I, I got introduced to the social movements organizing around disability and neurodiversity. Uh, but also when I start uh, talking and doing interviews with uh, autistic adolescents and also with parents of uh, young autistic children. And I guess this way I came to understand what's actually at stake when looking at the ethics of early autism care and how that kind of differed a bit from uh, other discussions in public health ethics. And at least for me, what I, what I learned is that what's at stake here in this discussion are more conceptual and more uh, political questions. Questions about what autism is, how we can conceive of autism, what kind of support is actually desirable, uh, but also who gets to decide on these, uh, on these matters. Because when clinicians go assign uh, uh, to very young children, when they assign a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, also by definition, uh, framing developmental differences as a pathology and as a condition that requires uh, an intervention. And often these interventions involve reducing uh, autism characteristics, which is uh, uh, practically opposing the rightful existence of uh, autistic differences. At the same time, by doing interviews, I also learned uh, from autistic people and their relatives that uh, being assigned or receiving an autism diagnosis also brings a range of benefits. It, uh, uh, it, it offers a formal recognition of, uh, uh, of being different as compared to the norm. It also offers a justification often uh, to uh, demanding and receiving accommodations. And in some cases, it also uh, uh, opens opens up a way to to reach a community of people with uh, with similar experiences. And also, when it comes to more clinical support, uh, it's uh, autistic communities uh, often also welcome uh, some types of of clinical support. Of course, not to normalize autistic features, uh, but maybe rather uh, receiving support in. Uh, um, in, in overcoming or in, in dealing with uh, problems that are associated with autism, such as in young children that can, can involve uh, helping to foster functional ways of communication, uh, but also in adolescence or in adulthood, uh, uh, finding support for mental health issues such as uh, uh, anxiety and, and depression. And so in general, I think it's, and many other, other authors have, have claimed this, care is kind of a complicated concept. And also early autism care is a very ambiguous 
concept and we cannot easily label care as something uh, that's always good or always bad, something that's always just or always unjust. And so uh, from this perspective, uh, examining the ethics of early autism care really uh, requires to, to engage with these care practices. And I guess the main argument I try to defend uh, in, in my thesis is that we cannot turn our back on uh, clinical care practices for autism. Uh, not even when we take a neurodiversity perspective on autism. Because in the, uh, neurodiversity advocates have, I guess, rightfully claimed that what's needed is, is social and political change. Um, but also with this uh, broader social change in mind, I think there's an urgency to keep, to keep engaging with, uh, with clinical practices. Uh, and the reason, therefore, is that the, the Autism Clinic is, uh, is also very much a political space. It's a space where we can also work towards, uh, towards social change. And I guess this is what uh, I wrote my uh, final chapter on, that if we want to think about uh, good and just early autism care from a neurodiversity perspective, we really need to engage with these uh, uh, care practices and try to see autism care as a space where the, the meaning of an autism diagnosis can also be renegotiated where, uh, where we can recalibrate autism interventions to meet uh, autistic priorities more than they do right now. And also that we can see uh, uh, the autism clinic as a space of experimentation where power relations can also be, uh, can be altered. For example, by bringing in uh, autistic experts by experience as, uh, as, experts, uh, as ex experts themselves. And so in short, and that brings me back, I guess, to the, the title of my dissertation, I think, or that's what I, what I argue for, that the autism clinic could also be a space to affirm neurodiversity rather than, uh, than oppose it, as it's still uh, often the case, I guess, uh, these days. Um, yeah. I guess that's like what I wanted to say about my, my thesis. If you want, if you're interested, uh, it's a bill of a set up uh, uh, separate chapters that can easily be read uh, separately. You can find it uh, at the link. I also brought a few copies so you can come chat with me if you want to, to have one. Uh, and I think later today we'll dive in some related themes in the afternoon uh, in the discussion session, also in the, in the panel on academia and activism. I guess I'll share a bit more uh, about my positionality in this as a non-autistic researcher and trying to be uh, an ally to the neurodiversity movement and how I try to relate to this, uh, but that's for later today. Okay, thank you for your interesting uh, explanations. Uh, we have a little uh, less than 15 minutes for questions, so I'll jump straight to you again, uh, if there's someone with al already a very interesting question or non-interesting question, it's also possible. If not, I'll just oh, I'll come to the back. You said that um, clinics can be a space to affirm neurodiversity. The question I'd like to ask is, are they in practice set up to do that right now? Or does the medical system prevent that from actually happening at the moment? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's of course easy for me to, to write this down in a thesis and then just uh, back off and see what happens. Uh, but yeah. This is also really something that I'm engaging with right now and also uh, together with others uh, we'll be engaging with in the, in the coming months and years and really reaching out to these clinical practices because I guess that's where the real work needs to, needs to happen in this domain. Uh, and I've had a few uh, discussions, for example, in centers where they do uh, uh, autism diagnostics and, and support. And uh, at least in Flanders, uh, talking about autism in terms of neurodiversity is still something fairly new. So uh, I guess this is... Uh, it means that there's still a lot of work to happen, but at the same time, I feel that the uh, debate is not uh, very much polarized yet, and there's clearly an openness to talk about this. Um, at the same time, it's uh, often for clinical practitioners not easy to uh, yeah, make quite fundamental changes to their, to their practices. Uh, and so one of the first uh, things 
I uh, often bring to the table and that they seem to be quite open to is to start thinking about how to bring in autistic expertise, uh, expertise by experience, uh, and to really invite autistic people and to talk about their practices or when they do, when, uh, for example, psychoeducation uh, sessions are organized for, for parents or to autistic people directly, to simply bring in also uh, an autistic expert by experience and to co-deliver these sessions together with uh, non-autistic practitioners. Uh, so these are some things that we're experiment, or we that that at some places in Flanders clinical practices are experimenting with. Um, and so now my gut feeling is that there is an openness to to start doing this work. Uh, at the same time, also yeah, want to be critical about it and see where this leads us in two or three years, because yeah, it's maybe now there's an interest because there's uh, this term neurodiversity is a bit still a bit new in our context. Uh, maybe this is what spurs the interest uh, but we'll have to see in a few years uh, when it also results in, in proper change thank you yeah thank you i i see um labeling um uh, with with different neurodiversity labels and particularly autism as definitely having some helpful effects but also unhelpful effects. Um, so how do you see that sort of balance be between the helpful and the unhelpful effects, maybe both for the individual, but also for other people? So in, in the system where I work, resources are limited. So that if you make easier access for one child to a system of special support, then it becomes more difficult for others. So you're having to prioritize a bit. So, well, it's, so my, my thesis was partly on autism and I think this is a very uh, good question, but I think, I think it was done. Uh, before because labeling something as a label is already labeling it to some extent i think uh, speaking as an autistic person uh, having access to autism as a way to form come to terms with uh, my life history with my crash allowing my children to come to terms with it i think that's we have to see that. I think that was also in Christine's first book. I think people look at it from the point of view, can we prioritize in the clinic? I don't think you have to look at autism or Tourette's primarily from that point of view, if you take neurodiversity seriously. First of all, it is a word that allows people to come together, to share something, to make sense of their experience. Then obviously, uh, if you come to the clinic, uh, and maybe Gertian can say more about that, if you come to the clinic, you have to prioritize. I understand that. But I think from within the community, there is little resistance to the fact that people in the clinic need to prioritize. The only resistance which there is, is that people would prioritize using subcategories or sublabels or whatever, because then again, you this allow people to identify as as a group uh, to make sense as a group to make sense across so then you kind of put a label where somebody is really ill or whatever or is really autistic and that person cannot for some lead institutionally it's more difficult for that person to come together with another person which maybe has less less difficulty in life for whatever reason and vice versa also from a scientific point of view breaking <laughs> that bond uh, also means that you will maybe not understand autism because you will associate it with certain problems or not and looking at it at it from a problematic point of view there was a question on epigenetics uh, earlier but to be honest I, I don't understand why geneticists and epigeneticists don't understand it there are many monogenetic known diseases where the phenotype is like all over the place, but really all over the place. So why would you expect that uh, you could 
use something in that clinically one directional way. So for me, that's uh, so I'm rather for me, that's really important to first to realize that the priority in neurodiversity, the priority of autism or whatever is not a clinical priority. It is a person priority. Uh, and then, okay, we have to deal with prioritizing in the clinic, but clinicians maybe first have to be a little bit humble <laughs> and it's not their word. Huh? So uh, I think that's, that's for me the answer. Maybe too long. Kertian, do you want to add? Um, maybe check with, you know, if there's, yeah. yeah. Um, does this already go in the direction that you were expecting things to go or because I also yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a helpful response. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I suppose I was thinking about the uh, problems that can happen. Maybe, maybe it's not so much with neurodiversity. I don't know, but that can happen from the expectations of teachers and parents in an educational system uh, that which can lead into self-fulfilling uh, problems for the child and may maybe that's, that's may maybe that is less of a, of a problem than or maybe maybe the benefits for the family and the individual sort of are greater than the problems of changing expectations in, in teachers. And I'm not really competent to decide that. Uh, I'm involved in the new centers here in Antwerp about um, yeah, Leerstun, it's called. So support for students in from kindergarten until they are 18 to get support in school. And it changes now in the sense that um, it's not, it's not, yeah, special needs schools are working together with um, yeah, normal schools. Um, and the idea is not anymore to focus only on the child who needs support during their educational pathway, but also on the teacher. And so those people who need to come to the school are supporting the teacher the direction, the direction of the school, and the, so the I giving support in in creating a mission on education and basic needs in in a normal school, and the child. So there is a focus on what's called um, disability specific help, uh, inclusion. Um, there are four things. Um, um, I don't know them by heart anymore, but it's also about coaching of the teacher. And we try to go away from go entering a classroom and making a picture of there are my dyslexics, there are my autistic people, there are, there are the ADHD people. So that's the labeling. So no, it's your classroom and how does everyone interact with each other, but also with the material. So with the classroom, how the classroom is set up and that becomes the focus point of, of supporting the, that classroom, that school year. Um, so the people or the students or the pupils who are getting support are not only the pupils with the label, but also the others in relating to each other um, and setting up the dynamic of that classroom. So there, it's it just started this kind of working in September with the start of the new school year. So and I'm yeah very much looking forward how it will evolve. Um, so not, it's not really an answer, but an example of a practice in how um, people are now trying to support more the ecology of the classroom instead of only accommodate one pupil um, with, an, with a very individualistic uh, viewpoint. Yeah, thank you. Well, that, well that, that sounds a very exciting development mm -hmm. and maybe will overcome some of the, this, uh, some of the problems that labeling can, can give. Mm -hmm. So labeling is there, but your picture of the classroom is different. Okay, I think we have about two minutes for Christine to uh, give some. Yeah, can I add something to that? I will now put on my hat as a 
classical bioethicist or whatever, and I've been looking at this guy, exactly this kind of, of questions, also from the, from, uh, for example, the idea of fine medics, open uh, right to an open future of the child, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can say, uh, okay, if, if I give a child a diagnosis, a child who, who's, it's different from adults, eh? small children, they don't discover their own difference and then search for uh, a meaningful way of, of relating to that difference, for example, by identifying as neurodivergence. Uh, but the child is the child that comes to the uh, psychiatrist is mostly it's the parents or the or the teachers etc and then it's decided that autism autism or something else is a good way to to describe the challenges that the child has yeah? um, and then all these ethical questions kick in of of the the right of the child to the to an open future on the one hand having a diagnosis can really open up the future can really add support etc on the other hand there's still something very restrictive on the way we look at at diagnosis and labels like autism like okay this is now set in this this is now how you are uh, for the rest of your life there is no flexibility no no change uh, we have now named you when you're five years old for example and that's very that's an ethical question yeah? uh, how do you how do you choose whether this is actually opening up their future or not and the way i started to think about it is that autism is is not only a description of someone, but it's also an identity. An identity. It's 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 real. I'm not saying that autism is purely like a linguistic thing. It's a real part of who you are. But it's also something that you relate to. That is um, that that is uh, that can change in the course of your life. Yeah? That that it's the meaning can change. You're not going to suddenly not become some completely different, but the way you're experiencing your autism, the way you're relating to your autism can change throughout your life. And when it comes to children, uh, I think the problem is not as much the, the, the fact that we're, the, the, that we are giving a name to, to challenges that the children has and that we sort of provide a framework of looking at these children, but that we then assume that this is set in stone and the children are ne never again thought about, uh, talked about it. You're, you're now like this and deal with it. Whereas it has to be, I think, a constant negotiation. What does it mean for you? Uh, now you're 16 year old, do you still, still um, uh, identify with it or, or do you identify with it, but it means something different, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the right way to go ahead is to constantly to allow for this dynamic view on autism or on, on other uh, developmental diversity as something that is also, the meaning is also changing throughout the life. And, and when a child grows up, they get to also um, get a say in relating to the meaning and, and trying to find out what it means for them. And I think maybe in psych psychiatry, sometimes we go wrong there. We, we, we say, okay, this is now who you are. You're five years old. And um, well, yeah. So <laughs> this is how your life will go, by the way. I, I think that's problematic. I think there are other ways. Uh, then we uh, have Simon to make more problems. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. To make uh, I think we can do that maybe for coffee because we're already no, no, over it's time. 20 second long. Uh, okay. okay. I, I, Simon taught me I need to make <laughs> problems. I yeah. just forgot to say something, which is a detail, but it says 304 pages and then people say, I won't read that, but I actually spent more than half a year summarizing it in the first 60 pages so actually it is 60 pages and then 240 pages of the same thing at length that was it yeah, so. um, okay uh thank you everyone for uh, your fruitful discussions uh we can now go to a nice coffee break in the jury room the one you entered uh when you came in so thank you everyone <laughs>